knows a lot about all kinds of stuff. Professor Dave explains. With some understanding of medieval philosophy, we are now ready to examine the status of logic in that time period. The patristic period in medieval philosophy only had access to a handful of Aristotelian texts regarding logic, thanks to Boethius and a few others, and they notably lacked his material on syllogisms. Up until Aristotle's resurgence, this period was known as logica vetas, or old logic, and not much of relevance was developed. The first original Western logician was Peter Abelard, who surprisingly only had access to the same logical texts and translations as everyone since Boethius. A nominalist, as we saw, he defended that mere words do not necessarily correspond to facts about the world. Therefore, he focused on the propositional aspects of logic in order to analyze arguments as a whole, the first to do so since the Stoics, as term logic would be too caught up on common nouns and adjectives, or status as he poised them. Propositions would be dicta, referencing not only a word but also the speaker's intention of meaning, and they would be the only sentences able to be true or false, as status would be incomplete in themselves. Despite Abelard's immense developments in logic, the rest of Aristotle's translations came to the West by the 11th century, and much of what he worked on had already been surpassed by the Greek philosopher. Avicenna was the major Middle Eastern researcher of Aristotelian logic, as he not only read all of it, but criticized and developed it further toward new areas. The first key difference is that he used modal terms in assertoric propositions. For example, Every YouTuber is necessarily mortal. Here we see that no matter how absolute an assertoric proposition is, it can also be modal. He also introduces time as a variable in temporally modalized syllogistics. So even these apparently absolute universal affirmative or type A sentences that we learned about in an earlier tutorial may vary from referring to all individuals are always X, as in a predicate which happens invariably in the past, present, and future, to all members of that category, to all individuals occasionally happen sometimes to be X. For example, every teacher is necessarily sometimes teaching or sometimes not teaching. Though these advances themselves were not in any way revolutionary, Avicenna's legacy was that every posterior logician was responding to his commentary and developments of Aristotle instead of to Aristotle himself. Though direct references to him faded after a couple of centuries in the West, he was still widely discussed in Middle Eastern traditions up until the 20th century. This new period in the West, informed with substantially more material on logic than the previous one, was called Logica Nova, or New Logic. Following Avicenna's influence in the medieval period, Aquinas widely used logic to treat theological issues, and though he didn't develop anything too original, he contextually influenced much of what came next as well. This amalgam of logical development from Abelard's efforts, Avicenna's thorough research, and Aquinas's centering logic in every debate, characterized this new period of logic studies, leading to its widespread popularity in the final centuries of the medieval period. Four major areas were treated by many authors during this time. Sin categorimata, obligationes, insolubilia, and terminist logic. The study of sin categorimata focuses on the words which are not used as subjects or predicates in a sentence, like all, every, whole, both, nothing, and but, for example. These are terms which connect and influence the categories. Categories which we've seen in the first logic tutorial, and also in the tutorial on Aristotelian logic, refer to the predicates, or the classes in which an entity or subject may be included. The obligationes was a specific mode of debate with specific rules between an opponent who would present a thesis and a res who would either question, accept, or doubt it, both of whom were utilizing logical rules of discourse. When the former would decide, the process would end and res's responses would be analyzed to verify the logical thoroughness and consistency of such thesis, the obligation its name refers to, working much like a session of fact-checking, but for logical validity. 
the insolubilia, or the insolubles, referenced fallacies and paradoxes in logic. It resurged when Boethius's translation of Aristotle's The Sophistic Refutations gained major attention during this time, which refers to his contempt of sophists and focuses on how to categorize, identify, and execute fallacies in argumentations. Fallacies, simply put, are faulty reasonings attempting to pass as valid ones. A simple example by Aristotle was, whatever you have not lost, you still have. You have not lost horns, therefore you still have horns. It seems at first a valid and true syllogism, however absurd the conclusion may seem, but upon further inspection we realize that the first premise is false, invalidating the entire argument. The importance of studying fallacies lies in the fact that they may seem true, and they may serve as a foundation to a greater argument that we can come to accept as valid in a discussion, unaware of the trickery of even subtler forms of fallacious syllogisms. But unlike elsewhere in his logical works, Aristotle was lacking in this regard, as these writings were incomplete, poorly executed, and left much to be done on the topic. Medieval discussion did not advance much in this regard, but special attention was given to the liar paradox, famous in ancient philosophy. In short, this sentence is false, is a paradox, for if it's true, then, as it says, it's false, and if it's false, then it is true. In the 20th century, it was the center of a crisis in logic, epistemology, and philosophy of language, among others, but in medieval times, it was treated merely as an interesting logical pastime. The fourth major area was terminist logic, developed by recognizing that the truth of a proposition was dependent on the meaning of its individual words in given sentences, which could not be analyzed by grammar, linguistics, or even syllogistics. For example, Dave may be assumed to have only one meaning when we read Dave is a YouTuber, but it seems to be different according to context, like when we read Dave is a mammal and Dave is a monosyllable. It is thus not, as the name suggests, an analysis of words, but of terms in a contextual logic. This was an important development, as it preceded what would be Leibniz's formulation later in the 17th century, and also what would become contemporary theories of reference. But as was common in medieval times, the manner in which they solved it was flawed and had little to add to the debate, as it led to strange occurrences like all behemoths are behemoths, always being false, as behemoths never existed and all roses are fragrant will always be true even if roses ceased to exist. One final notorious concept was the Occam's razor, also called law of economy or of parsimony, a concept still widely used nowadays. It usually clashed with a predominant concept called the principle of sufficient cause, which denoted that everything must have a reason, foundation, or cause for existence. This would be problematic, as it would require countless positing of ontological entities to explain simple facts. Strangely, William of Ockham did not originally formulate this concept as the name suggests, as it apparently was a common adage with the scholastics and is traceable even to the pre-Socratics and Aristotle, who proposed in his logic writings regarding all sciences that all things being equal, simpler formulations requiring fewer premises are better and represent more valuable knowledge. This concept gained notoriety in the empirical sciences and mathematics, as the fewer the number of posits supporting a theory, formula, or the like, the higher the probability of it being right, as there's statistically less chance of any of those posits being false or just being noise. Though many developments occurred in medieval logic, their ignorance of ancient texts and the unification with theology made them slow and fairly negligible, becoming almost completely surpassed only a few centuries after its end. The era marking most of its advance also marked the end of the medieval times, characterizing the themes of our next period in the series, modern philosophy, where theories and their quality grew dramatically higher in just a few centuries, in contrast with the handful of minor improvements during more than a millennium. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.